So, hello everybody here on site and at home um, before your screens and whatever device. Welcome to another session of Making Sense of the Digital Society. For once here in Frankfurt am Main within the festival Politik im Freien Theater. So that's a, kind of a very special and new uh, edition here because our series has been running uh, for more than five years actually. The first session was in December 2017 in Berlin. We've been going on ever since. Um, and it is a joint venture, so to speak, between the Federal Agency of Civic Education in German, the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung, and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. So thank you for having us here in Frankfurt for this, um, yeah, for this venture out into the republic, so to speak. Um, the structure is pretty straightforward here. We have a talk of our guests for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, then it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation here on stage, followed by questions from the floor. We have a microphone here uh, going around to take your questions. And there's also, for uh, you people watching at home or wherever, a participatory tool called Slido, where you uh, may ask your questions. We're kind of bundling them up together, and they're going to be read out to us here on stage. And I would also like to um, mm, divert your attention to a very nice feature tool by the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. It's an online compendium, actually. Uh, you can see the URL right there. Most lectures and also talks of this series in its fifth year now are online as video in, the, in full length, actually, but there's also a whole lot of extra content. There's podcasts made around some thematic um, structures, uh, additional interviews being conducted after the lecture series. Um, so it's a really, it's a gold mine, if you ask me. If you want to see and hear top experts about so many aspects of the digital society, please check it, check it out. Last note, maybe, uh, and this one really may be worth looking at for teachers and lecturers who are not thoroughly familiar with the subject matter, who is, really. And if you're not a professional, in the field that includes me, so to speak, at least I'm not a researcher in any way, it is really hard to stay on top when we talk about this digital transformation. Where do you turn to if you want to brush up on, you know, especially now on so many crises uh, of our day? Long gone are the times, of course, um, where at least I read one newspaper in the morning almost from start to end. When I started college, it was actually two newspapers a day uh, that I browsed through in the morning. Um, then maybe some people uh, consulted a TV newscast in the evening, maybe um, an audio, you know, uh, a radio bulletin at midday, maybe one in the afternoon and so forth. Today, we think this was excessive media behavior, right? And so many newspapers, so much TV at night and so forth, but was it really that excessive? Um, yeah, you're probably right. But my working in the media field had to do with it, but if you compare this, what I just outlined, to what, what many people do today, you know, consume or comment on the internet, whatever the device, my old professionally motivated media habits seem all of a sudden a lot less excessive. Because daily screen time does not seem to stop growing. Because endless doom scrolling bad news has become a phenomenon with a name, actually, nowadays. Because we do almost everything online. And we don't have to be online if we walk the streets. I mean, there's a whole lot of recording going on, which we're going to hear about tonight. And the pandemic, of course, has increased the time spent online even more. So many of us do not just consume one or two offline media a day, but visit very many different sites uh, all the time. While we troll the net, we are being tracked and surveilled, of course. We may be, uh, you know, be able to manage our cookies now in the European Union, but do you really manage your cookies every time you enter a website? I don't. But there's one principle that applies to online as to offline space. It's one of many principles, of course, that increasing traffic means also less security. I mean, that's the, you know, the case for roads and cars, and it's the case with internet traffic, just the same. Wanting to have both, mobility without end, but also high security, poses a series of logical problems to begin with. Tonight's edition will shed, I think, light on some of them. 
So, you know, we have touched on this question several times in the past five years of this series, how to resist massive data trawling and brokerage, what can be done on an individual level, what on a political and regulatory level. We have discussed these hands-on questions usually towards the end uh, of our sessions and the conversations here. And of course, these questions are notoriously hard to answer, and science does not necessarily have an obligation to answer them either, I think. But if we were being honest at those sessions, the speaking, mostly professors, confessed it was easier for them to limit their internet traffic and uh, to do some form of digital detox because they were privileged enough to have secretaries and research assistants, for example. But tonight is different. And I'm quite sure that this is not a night about detoxing. Do not expect a manual how to be good and safe online or on the road. At least I suspect you should not expect that. But resistance in the datafied society, as tonight's lecture is called, is probably a good hint that we're going to treat questions of what to do more prominently. Or what would be desirable to do, what we have to be able to imagine first in order to find counter strategies to online surveillance, data mining, and so forth be it by corporate players or, of course, the state. Our guest tonight has traveled all the way from Amsterdam to Frankfurt by train. She made it in time, so thanks to uh, public transportation in Germany, you can't say that every day. She was born and raised in Padova in northern Italy, where she did her first studies. She then moved on to the European University Institute near Florence to get a PhD in political and social sciences. Currently, she is Associate Professor of New Media and Digital Culture at the University of Amsterdam and a Faculty Associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. But our guest tonight also partakes in, I quote from her fabulous website, go check it out, grassroots engagement with data and data infrastructure called data activism. So, for example, she is principal at the Date Active Ideas Lab. Maybe a quick reference to some of her books. Almost 10 years ago now, she published Social Movements and Their Technologies Wiring Social Change. Last year, she co edited um, a volume called COVID 19 from the Margins Pandemic Invisibilities, Policies, and Resistance in the Datafied Society. And this monograph is in preparation, I'm told. Data activism from information to agency. I think we're all going to get a glimpse from this upcoming book. But now please welcome her from Amsterdam all the way to Frankfurt, Stefania Milan. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much to organizers for having me here. It's a pleasure for a variety of reasons, including because this is one of my first uh, talks after maternity leave. So let's see whether I still remember uh, what uh, I used to do right before my life changed uh, for good. And you're going to see actually in the talk several references to you know, thinking about what it means to grow up today in the datafied society. So um, meet. Robert Julian Borchak Williams. This man that you see there, a couple of years ago in Michigan, in the United States, has been wrongfully arrested for shoplifting in an expensive boutique. This was before because it has, he has been misidentified by facial recognition technology. So police forces had decided that some pictures taken, and they were pretty blurry pictures taken by a security camera in the shop, corresponded to the face of this guy that actually turned out to be completely honest and definitely not a shoplifter. The experience wasn't particularly present, pleasant, and he had actually had to um, you know, receive the apologies of police forces afterwards, but in the meantime, he was in jail, then he had to defend himself. Against whom? Well, of course, police forces, of course, security uh, cameras, of course, surveillance. But in fact, here we are talking about decisions made by an algorithm or a series of algorithms. So an algorithm that, as it is in facial recognition technology, identifies some features of a face, not actually the complete face, 
but the distances between some points, like the tip of the no nose and the corner of your mouth, and that the basis of these um, distances, this measurement, matches the pictures with existing uh, database and identifies suspects or culprits. Now, facial recognition technology has been used by public forces for over two decades, although it has been long known for being somewhat faulty. Robert was allegedly the first victim of algorithmic decision-making, but really the first that made the news that hit the media. In fact, unfortunately, there's many more Roberts around us. But facial recognition technology is increasingly a staple of contemporary society. You may think, well, I'm not Robert, I'm not, I don't have a dark skin, so probably, you know, I'm protected by all of this. I live in Germany where these things don't happen. But in fact, facial recognition technology is really between us, and it's much closer than we may think. For example, it is increasingly deployed in education uh, and uh, in the education sector in public schools. A few years ago, some French schools have been experimenting with facial recognition technology. Uh, for example, in Nice and Marseille, they were using uh, a tool provided by, for free, this is an interesting uh, point, by uh, the uh, tech company based in the US, Cisco, whom you might have heard of. And uh, this technology was used to control access to the entrance gate. In Paris, around the same time, facial recognition technology had been used by a number of schools to detect facial expressions and eye movement to see whether students were paying attention to the lecture. So it's no longer enough to just sit at the back of the room and hide behind the taller guy, right? Because the software is going to track you down and, of course, report you to the teacher as being not a very good student. But similar stories were... Um, uh, found also in other European countries, like, for example, in Sweden. And those were merely trials, so we're talking about 2017, 2018, but this is indeed the future that awaits our children and our students. You might remember in the pandemic, the famous proctoring software to make sure the students taking exams at home would not cheat. And I have an example um, on that later. But yesterday, I was in Amsterdam and I popped in a big fair called EduTech Europe Fair. So this is a fair that uh, was held in various uh, countries and for the 2022 edition was in Amsterdam, if it ended uh, tonight. And the buzzwords there were emotion detection and personalized learning. Now, there was a lot of strange talking about all of this, and often, as a teacher, I, was, um, I found myself thinking about the fact that, indeed, personalized learning is something we strive uh, for, even without technology. Community building, uh, the same. Although there, the, the story was that we really need technology to solve all these problems, including, for example, teacher shortage. And I found out, for example, about a tool called Smile ML. The picture that you see on the screen comes from the description of this tool that is powered, among others, by Google Education, which uses AI, artificial intelligence, to capture human sentiment. The idea here is that the teacher has to have constant feedback from the class because happy pupils are more prone to learning. But as a suspicion person like me may wonder, perhaps this is also conducive to become happy consumers? But maybe that's just me being a little suspicious. But this is the type of feedback that you get. And this is soon going to be part also. I mean, it's just one of the many components uh, that is offered to uh, teachers. We live in an increasingly data-fied society. The urban environment is datafied. Think about the smart city. The workplace is datafied. Think of on-demand labor gigs, uh, like uh, you know, mediated by platforms like Uber, like Deliveroo, or whatever service you have in Germany that delivers food to your doorstep. 
but also friendships and relationships are datafied. Think of social media, but also apps like Tinder. And our health is datafied as well. You know, as a woman, I cannot but think about period tracks, uh, tra tracking apps, which are a very good example of being constantly monitored, or actually deliberately constantly monitoring ourselves through technology. But the message here, uh, you know, the, the, the really the core uh, mission of the data file society, if you will, is to make the world better through data. And information in the data file society has become a constitutive force in society. It's a commodity, it's something that companies trade and thrive on. It's a, it's a currency also for the state who wants to have information about its citizens. But it's also something that it's not only collected, but it's also used to shape social reality. Think, for example, about social media content able to steer elections. And, you know, of course, we think about the Trump elections in 2018, but, um, you know, we have evidence from the political election uh, in 2021 in the Netherlands of the role of Facebook, for example, not in massively steering votes, but in promoting homophily. So, you know, promoting the formation of close-knit communities of people that think alike, and of course, not um, promoting exposure to uh, diverse ideas. And in a nutshell, really the message of the data file society is that data has, or must have, really, a better idea than us tiny humans. But at the same time, data has no values, right? Although at the same time, it's not definitely as neutral as we might be told all the time, right? If data knows better, data is objective as well. Well, a lot of people, not just me, have contested uh, this idea. But it's still one of the late motives of the, the times we live uh, in. Now, the COVID pandemic has, if possibly, accelerated the datification of society. Because it worked as a test lab to pioneer or repurpose technologies, including, for example, biometric uh, surveillance, in the hope or in the faulty, to some extent, promise of curbing virus diffusion. So we were told that, for example, contact tracing app will definitely help us. Maybe in Germany it worked. I can tell you that in Italy that project was very quickly abandoned uh, for obvious reasons, because they were not able to actually track anything nor to handle the data in a safe uh, manner. But this is just an, a, a tiny example. Um, digital identity is another case in point. Um, there's been a massive increase about in the year, uh, in the, uh, around 80% increase of the use, the adoption of digital technology solutions in the marketplace, but also, for example, at the state level. That's the case of Canada. So when the public administration cannot deal directly with uh, uh, its citizens, then they go for this sort of solutions, which might be very convenient. In the Netherlands, for example, through your digital identity, you do pretty much anything from enjoying healthcare to the, the less enjoyable uh, element of paying uh, taxes. But, of course, this also comes with some uh, orders in the sense that it's not always necessarily clear who and for what purposes handles the data. And given we are in Germany, I cannot but think about the Luca app and the fact that Although it was promised otherwise, the data were released to police forces beyond its original uh, stated use of curbing virus diffusion to uh, instead track um, crime more in general. But so the pandemic, these are just some examples, it has uh, on the one hand augmented the governmental demand for problem solving through technology but it's also, at the same time, overriding, override the public concerns over privacy risks. So we were more prone than before to say, yes, give it to me, whatever it takes on my data, just so that I can go again back to dancing, back to the restaurant, back to the stadium. And in fact, that's how it was often introduced, technology. 
intrusive technology like facial recognition technology. In Italy, for example, in the aftermath of the pandemic, assuming we are already out of it, which is probably not the case, but um, when finally uh, this, uh, football resumed again, the Roma um, football club in Rome, uh, in the, the stadium spent several million euros to implement a system of facial recognition cameras that with the, the byline that, of course, now we can finally return to the stadium because it was able to track the temperature of stadium uh, goers. But no one, at least to my knowledge, raised the question, at least publicly, of privacy concerns or whether, for example, this was the most uh, welcome or most necessary or most useful even a measure to take. And although we really have been promised a better world through data datification, datification contributes to augment inequalities and to perpetuate injustice. And unfortunately, it eats harder in marginalized communities and in countries with poor rule of law. And it affects vulnerable communities, vulnerable groups, and racialized individuals the most. I mentioned earlier the software used in a lot of uh, universities across the world to allow students to take, take exams in the solitude or their bedroom at home during the pandemic. How can you make sure that students do not teach, that no one passes on suggestions, that they're not opening uh, books or that they have you know, uh, the entire uh, book pasted to, to the wall in front of them? How do you make sure that an exam is still fair, which we are always quite concerned of as uh, teachers? Well, the software used in most Dutch universities to monitor these remote exams um, and ensure the students wouldn't cheat discriminated against dark skin tone, which led uh, to a student of the uh, Free University of Amsterdam to file a complaint in front of the Netherlands Institute for Human Rights. And we are still awaiting for uh, you know, what uh, the institute is going to decide on this. The picture here actually refers to a similar case and a few similar, in fact, collection of scary cases. Uh, it's a documentary that if you, if you have not watched, I invite you uh, to take a look at. It's called Coded Bias. It was released in 2020 and recounts the story of Joy Bolambini, an MIT student who also, because of um, um, her skin tone, had problems using facial recognition uh, software during her uh, schoolwork, which led them, given we are talking about resistance, to protest big time so to you know uh, not only then uh, end up in a documentary but also to start an organization the algorithmic justice league that is trying precisely to change uh, this type of uh, situation for a lot of communities of color and more but uh, you know we are looking mostly at um, so far at least my examples were from Europe or from Germany and uh, from what we can consider, and rightly so, I think, privileged uh, countries, privileged situations, although, as we know, pockets of poverty and dispossession exist also in our very rich Western society. But if you go, for example, even beyond that, in, in countries with, um, you know, maybe not a super strong uh, rule of law, you can see situations that are even uh, worse meaning technology is uh, implemented and deployed in situations where there are um, little safeguards for citizens and uh, the result is often fairly scary. In India, as my colleague Silvia Masiero um, reported from the University of Oslo, uh, the fact that biometric identification was used to give people in need access to ration subsidized commodities so food, right, through a network of ration uh, shops. So this was food for families in need that uh, they could have access through, through uh, their fingerprint. So the use of biometric identification brought the program to a halt because of the risk of disease transmission associated with fingerprint identification. So you can imagine a situation in which a country closes down People often working in an informal economy are not able to do so anymore. And 
these were people that even earlier in normal conditions relied on food subsidies and all of a sudden because of the digital identification system and the biometric identification implemented in this case as part of the digital identity scheme um, was deemed dangerous in their situation then all of a sudden they cannot put food on the table so privacy so all the concerns of the data file society you can name them sound often uh, you know a luxury program problem something that we you know have time to think about and energies and education and the skills uh, to do so and sometimes also the, the right machines and the right uh, devices but in fact the consequences are probably even worse without probably they are even worse for people who don't have all this uh, luxury um, assistance so is it a system failure? For sure, uh, as a sociologist, I feel like datification changes and to some extent endangers the democratic system as we know it. And I talk about democracy, not because it's the only point of reference, the only or the best system that exists, although about half of, um, of the world population resides in a democracy, although not all of them are, you know, working uh, to, to perfection, but I mention it and I refer to uh, democracy and to liberal democracy in particular because it is the system that constitutionally at least upholds the highest safeguards for its citizens in terms, for example, of human rights. So if democracy suffers, then imagine what happens then in an authoritarian country when um, technology is used actively to, for example, surveil uh, people. But what I'm going to talk about now is democracy. And, um, well, it is in a way a system failure, or it could become a system failure. For sure, datification has accelerated the crisis of liberal democracy. Now, we already know, we already heard a lot about that in the popular media, in, you know, bar talks, that there's a problem with liberal democracy, there's a problem with voting, and we know that there is, uh, you know, in representative democracies, uh, so in the representative voting, there is um, always lower voter turnout, younger people, the younger generations, and not to be particularly in tune with the idea uh, of voting. We've seen some, uh, you know, um, um, populist uh, governments emerged from uh, these uh, voting exercises. So all of this has been widely studied by a lot of great colleagues. But here I want to draw attention to what democracy, sorry, what uh, datification does then to the system of liberal democracy. And I only mentioned three elements amongst probably a much longer list. But these are the ones where I've done uh, research on. So they're only, it's only, sorry, only partial depiction of the problem. You can add your own for your own perspective. So the first is the observation that uh, the increasing role of the increasing role of the industry in democracy. So the industry meaning that in fact a handful of large corporations, they're monopolist or semi-monopolist, very vertical, vertically organized tech corporations, play an increasingly big role in state affairs visible really in the mediation of the relation of the state with its citizens. So here I'm not talking about, for example, the problem of lobbying. So you might be aware that, for example, at the European Union level, so in Brussels right now, people are discussing um, the new AI and the new Digital Market Act, so legislation that is supposed to set some boundaries to this magmatic uh, market. Uh, and uh, I don't have data about lobbying related to this specific um, act, but uh, I've noticed how um, there were an unprecedented amount of lobbyists in the, I think in the uh, order of 4,000 only that descended on Brussels during the negotiations for the general data protection uh, regulation which you're all probably very familiar with. So something that was, came into force in 2017, so already a, uh, a few years back. But that uh, created quite some hurdles for, for example, US-based tech companies. 
because of data uh, transfer across borders and so on and so forth and data protection afforded to European citizens. So that's a problem, so the lobbying and the influence of the industry into legislation formation, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that, for example, in Amsterdam, and in fact in most uh, Dutch uh, villages and small to big cities, if I want to talk to my local representative, if you want to talk to the uh, local administration for a problem, a problem in garbage collection, a broken lamp, you name it, I have to do it through Facebook or especially WhatsApp, which in fact is the same company. So we see more and more intrusion of technology into this, um, this type of relation between the state and the citizen. The same can be, um, can be seen uh, with relation to a lot of COVID-related uh, technology, like uh, co uh, contact tracing app or the, the digital um, uh, COVID certificate, right? A lot of this um, software was provided by the private sector. And we, you, we can only speculate what this might mean in terms, for example, of uh, data protection and privacy, but also in terms of you know, the democratic process of relating through my representatives, for example. Then the second observation has to do with surveillance. And I'm sure in this series you've heard a lot of people much better than me, much more informed than me talking about uh, surveillance. So what I'm going to mention today is only the fact that you know, the surveillance, the mass surveillance that was made visible by, for example, the Snowden revelations, which exposed how national security agencies across the world, in fact, preventively spy and collect data in a blanket manner on their citizens. Well, this phenomenon as, or the observation, the, the public noticed that this mass surveillance exists and it is so mass, has um, altered the trust of the citizens towards the state, including what has been called uh, the, the, the social contract between the state and its citizens. And finally, a third observation of how datification has accelerated the crisis of liberal democracy has to do with social media and the algorithmic personalization of content, including content of political nature, which is operated by social media uh, platform, which, uh, you know, exposes us on social media platforms only to opinions of, uh, which are uh, like ours and increases um, um, you know, in-group behavior at the expenses of exposure to uh, different uh, opinion. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental dialectic exchange, which is key to a healthy uh, democracy. But today I'd promise to not just talk about the depressive part of the story, but to talk about also resistance. So how can we continue to exercise our political agency? our rights as citizens in such a monitor environment. Is resistance at all possible or is it just an, an utopia? I don't have an answer to this, I can already anticipate that. Uh, how can we organize resistance individually and collectively in this ever more complex datafied society? And the problem does not only concern resisting to the data files society per se, like fighting surveillance in public space. So I don't want cameras, I remove the cameras, or I ask someone to remove the cameras. It's also about being able to express dissent in a society which increasingly monitors its citizens even when they are not, uh, they have done nothing wrong, at least to that moment. Facial recognition technology, to go back to the examples that um, I started from, which is my current obsession given I'm, I'm researching it, uh, for example, means really giving away our identity when we are caught on camera. Pretty, pretty much like walking around town with a passport or an ID card open uh, and uh, paste to our forehead. Now, you might wonder how many cameras there are around us. Well, probably Frankfurt is, uh, or anywhere you, you are, is uh, better than London which is infamous for the intensity of uh, surveillance. In London, since 2020, the police has been implementing facial recognition technology in security cameras across town, although an independent review 
had found that the accuracy rate of these matches, so the matches between people caught on camera and you know people identified as suspect, is correct only in 19% of the cases, meaning that out of 100 people that are identified, 81 are misidentified and might end up in jail by mistake. But given this situation, in any case, someone has calculated that in London, and I, you know, admittedly, there might be a particularly bad situation, but ask about your uh, urban environment. Each Londoner has um, been estimated to be caught on security cameras about 300 times a day. So imagine, even if half of this is facial recognition technology, how much data and intrusive data is collected constantly about us. Now, um, in the slide here, you actually see this takes us to the United States of America, so a slightly different environment. But uh, there you see a Black Lives Matter activist named Derek Ingram, who has been arrested a couple of years ago in New York um, because he had participated to a demonstration, a Black Lives Matter um, anti-racist demonstration. And the way that he has been arrested was matching data from facial recognition technology with some Instagram pictures. Which means, very, to put it very simply, that you might not have anything to hide, and I hope it very much for you, but if I've ever been, if I have ever been on a social media uh, platform, you, me, we are all part of one of these databases against which uh, then facial recognition technologies try to find potential matches to identify suspects and culprits. So the situation is um, particularly scary for us all, despite, as I said, we might not have anything to hide. And um, then it shouldn't surprise us that in summer 2019, and this is a great example of resistance, Hong Kong uh, pro-democracy protesters, you might be familiar with the picture, attacked, tried to take down, you can see at the bottom there the picture, they are trying to take down this smart lamppost, which are feared, or were feared, to harbor facial recognition technology, which would have given away their identity as protesters. And this was a protest again, ex against extradition to China. So you can imagine that if you are protesting against China in Hong Kong, you definitely do not want to be uh, recognized because it has potentially dangerous consequences. But so, kudos to the Hong Kong protesters for doing that. It's a great example of resistance, but how can we make sense? So what I would like to do in the remaining of my talk is to sort of provide some examples of how we can engage uh, in uh, resisting the data fight society. What can be good solution? Not all of that immediate, right? They're not like the magic van that is gonna solve all the problems at once, but something that as society, as citizens, we should definitely engage with and think about. So the first, so the five, the first, so, well, first of all, uh, there are five types of action that, uh, as a sociologist, uh, you know, I would call the uh, action repertoires. So, the, these are essentially known practices that social movements and protesting individuals apply from time to time to revert a given situation or to promote social change. So now this is particularly new as a practice, so it has been part of what social movements have been doing for decades, in fact for centuries in various parts of the world. Social movements typically do not reinvent the wheel all the time, but they have been applied to data fight, uh, the data fight problem, uh, the problems of the data fight uh, society. And most of them uh, can be, you know, uh, they, they foresee, let's say, or they, they, they make room for both individual and collective engagement. And, uh, you know, you can resist uh, both through your phone, but can also resist in the street with other people, which is probably always a much more powerful um, approach. And so they, they are basically of both kinds, both individual and collective type of practice. The first one is probably, however, a bit more individual than uh, the other. And it concerns self-defense. Now, I was looking for a nice self-defense picture, and uh, you know, I just borrowed this from an organization called the Frontline Defenders. Also, kudos to them for all the amazing work that they do um, in uh, uh, helping especially human rights defenders in authoritarian countries to defend their activities and their persona. 
Um, but practicing self-defense in the data file society um, includes or starts from, for example, deciding on the setting of your, or, or your smartphone. Now, uh, the best situation would probably not to have a smartphone, but given probably also for practical reasons we all have it, well, deciding uh, on its setting is, is a good starting point. So what apps should have access to location services? What apps should have access to the camera? I actually happened to look at that this morning because I was a bit bored on the train and I noticed that some apps that had nothing to do with the camera that I had installed because they were public transport app, they had asked and automatically, right, they didn't ask me. It was probably in the terms of services, but you don't read, you know, this kind of super lengthy uh, legal um, text all the time. Uh, and uh, they had uh, actually uh, been granted access by the phone to a number of functionalities like location services that maybe they didn't need or I didn't want them to have access to. So while the situation might be, of course, rejecting smartphones, social media, bank cards, and all that, it might be hardly practical. So informed choices uh, is then um, the, the best answer. It also means preferring software and services, for example, the browser that you use so much, that implement highest um, uh, privacy safeguards. And no, Google is not one of them. But there are plenty of other examples that you probably uh, use. Uh, already. The second uh, strategy, the section action repertoire that you have available is subversion. Subversion in the data file society can take a lot of forms. And one is the very old social school, uh, the very old school destruction adopted by the Hong Kong uh, protesters. But it can also mean, for example, swapping travel cards. So in the Netherlands, a few years ago, paper tickets have been phased out. So you have to have a chip card. And uh, this chip card is usually individual, um, but it can also simply be anonymous. But in any case, all the data is collected constantly about your, uh, your uh, travels in the country. So what people started organizing in, uh, in the Netherlands are like small swap parties where they trade cards just with the idea of messing up with the data collection implemented by the card provider. So this is just one example. In the interest of time, I'm going to leave it at that. But there's many more other creative ways of doing that. The third has to do with literacy and education. It's a continuous learning activity for all of us because technology, of course, goes very fast and much faster than our ability to catch up and read about it and be concerned about, about all the privacy hurdles that it comes um, with. But in fact, uh, you know, uh, literacy and education has to do with self-education. So I have to, to educate myself and continuously so, not only because I teach about these things, but because I also use many of them. So it is, uh, you know, a challenge um, at every level of, uh, at every moment of our life. But um, it is also something that is extremely important to introduce in schools. And I know that some countries have timidly starting to teach school children how to use, how to deal with algorithms, how to understand popularity, for example, and virality on uh, social uh, media platforms. Or we need much more of that because if we are to be, to form the citizens of the future, they have to be informed not only about how voting works or how the parliament works, but also about how to defend themselves in this incredibly, increasingly difficult context. And uh, how do we keep ourselves informed? I want to uh, give a shout out to what are called crypto parties. Crypto parties are, they have been defined as the uh, Tupperware party for learning crypto. I don't know how much of you are familiar with Tupperware, probably this betrays my age, but essentially Tupperware are plastic boxes that our mothers used to buy and they would buy them from each other. So it was like a pyramidal scheme and then, uh, you know, they would just get together and teach each other, you know, tell each other all the secrets about this wonderful plastic stuff. And I say it with a bit of irony, but whatever. Um, and, uh, but it was really, you know, coming together over coffee, over whatever, a drink, a beer, to learn, to exchange information about something which was of vital importance. And, uh, you know, crypto parties do exactly that. They gather people who want to learn more about defending their privacy online. 
for example, masking their uh, communications. In the Netherlands, they're called privacy cafes. And before the pandemic, at least, they were used to be run mostly in public libraries, because that's a great public space, open to all, but also able to capture various. So not only the hacker-minded, or the, the one who are really obsessed with technology, but also those who simply have legitimate questions and do not know where to find answers. So literacy and education are key to resistance as well. And if you want to, to nurture resistant citizens, we have to start from school as well. Um, counter imaginaries. This is something that's probably a bit less familiar uh, to, to a lot of us, but um, social movements have been trying to change the terms of the debate, so to promote norm change across a variety of uh, fields. That's what, for example, the environmental movement uh, did. All of us now today feel a bit bad about flying, but maybe we didn't feel as bad about 15 years ago. Uh, be precisely because, you know, public debate on, for example, the um, environmental cost of flying has uh, changed. So, um, similarly, uh, there's a lot of groups that are trying, uh, and there are groups that work as sort of intermediaries in a way, so they are sort of experts, they are progressive developers, they are people who are engaged in digital rights activism, and they're actively trying to change the terms of the debate for um, you know, lay people as well. So to help people to understand technology and the challenges of technology by giving them alternative perspective on a given problematic aspect. And they interpret the needs and or serve the interests of the affected social groups by giving them, in a way, serving them a different story. And they make apparent uh, to um, how to, to respond, for example, how to engage in a given uh, situation. Now, this is actually a bit of a funny example. Uh, this is CV Dazzle, but I picked it because it was recently also in Vogue. So it has also reached a certain level of popularity. Uh, you, you can see it has to do with makeup and essentially resisting facial recognition technology, software, uh, by using a um, certain hairstyle or uh, you know, painting your face in a certain manner. So it explores how fashion can be used as camouflage from face detection technology which is the first step in automated, automated face uh, recognition. As you can understand, this is really not a very practical way of going around town just to hide yourself from facial recognition technology. At least it would be a lot of work every morning to have to set up all of that. But this type of workshop that um, this project called CV Dazzle organizes, they serve the purpose of showing people how the technology works and then making them think, playing with themselves about uh, you know, the dangers, the intrusiveness, to uh, you know, understand their feelings with a, this type of uh, technology and eventually also try to make informed choices. Now, it's not that we can always necessarily make informed choices about facial recognition technology, but this leads me to the, the, uh, to the strategy number five, the actual um, repertoire number five and the last one which concludes, uh, which concludes my uh, talk today. And this has to do with advocacy and um, campaigning. So ultimately, this is really the most collective of all these practices. This really showcases the power of um, coming together as a group to protest and demand change. This is a campaign that started a few years ago. It's a European uh, campaign for the most part, and the goal was to ask the EU, and I say was for a reason that I want to explain in a minute, was to ask uh, the European uh, Union to ban facial recognition technology in public space across the Union, so in all the member countries. I say was in the sense that there was also an attempt to start a European citizen initiative that is the referendum instrument of the European uh, Union, which however is a very, very complex one. The goal was to gather in the space of 12 months one million signature for at least seven member states, and unfortunately this campaign failed to do so although they even got an extension because of the pandemic. But as you can appreciate, facial recognition technology is not yet 
uh, top of the concerns of most citizens. But this campaign is a great example of how, you know, to also implement, uh, you know, count the creation of counter imaginaries because they were trying to posit and present um, facial recognition technology as dehumanizing. And also, it's an example of how, you know, to educate yourself and continuously educate yourself about, for example, legislation. And uh, it's also an example of self-defense. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, at the moment, um, the, the, the exercise of reclaiming your face, this is the name of uh, the campaign, is still going on. The focus is no longer on gathering, um, you know, um, signature to ask for new legislation to ban uh, facial recognition in public space, but uh, the focus and the energies are concentrated on um, trying to influence the, from the creation of the AI Act, which has a good part on facial recognition technology. But ultimately, this is a good uh, reminder of the fact that uh, if we don't like something, we can resist as individual, we can resist as, uh, as a group, but probably the uh, most fruitful manner to resist is to ask for better laws and rules. Inform ourselves and others about risk and challenges and mobilize against measures that we find unfair and discriminatory or simply invasive of our privacy. I hope this is not an exhaustive collection of strategies of resistance, but I hope I inspire you a little bit. And there's more in this uh, website, and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much for your talk and for teaching us, so to speak, uh, Estefania, uh, five ways of um, resisting datification. I'd like to talk um, about that in a little bit more detail in a minute, but I'd like to start out with um, an observation I made 10 days ago in this very city of Frankfurt, and it sort of ties in with an example you gave of, um, was it AS Roma or Lazio Roma, some Roman football club? Uh, Okay, um, uh, for another event we're having tomorrow on cryptocurrencies, trading apps, sustainable finance, and so forth, I was trying to do um, street survey with my phone. And I was asking people if I could film them, asking them about whether they knew about crypto, were they using crypto, uh, what did they do with trading apps, do, did they think that the banks should be regulated more tightly, especially here in Frankfurt and so forth. I spent eight hours on the street and I had three hits. Uh, which was extremely low, and I had to sort of, I had, start, I had started to cast friends of mine, friends of friends of mine, so that I could actually find enough people to um, edit three different clips in those subjects. And I was really surprised, because I've done that before, and it was much easier. I mean, it could have been because I didn't have a huge camera, I didn't have a sound man, and it just, I didn't have this authoritative, you know, look. It was just some dude with a selfie stick and a telephone. That's not very incriminating, right? Um, but then I, I started to ask myself, are people actually becoming more sensitive to facial recognition than I was, I mean, spending eight hours on about five different spots here in the city in Frankfurt and having three hits is a really low uh, turnout, right? Right? And uh, then I was thinking of your example of the football stadium where I thought, are actually hooligans of a Roman football club letting that happen? Facial recognition uh, uh, in their stadium, that would be almost unthinkable to me, especially after this experience here in Frankfurt. Are people getting more sensitive when it comes to facial recognition? Is something happening there? Is this on? Yeah. Uh, well, I uh, wish people were becoming more aware mm -hmm. uh, and uh, more critical, but um, in my, from my perspective, from my point of view, which is in a way partial, mm -hmm. but there's not enough uh, awareness, enough, enough um, people are not scared enough. Um, probably it's also because a lot of the examples that uh, we use often refer to, for example, racialized individuals or people with a darker skin and a lot of the people that we see in the society where we live uh, feel they have nothing to fear precisely because, uh, you know, the examples are often of um, people that are different from uh, the majority. 
Um, and facial recognition technology is known to be biased, not really against, but in fact that's what happens. It's not optimized, that's the right terminology, for uh, darker skin uh, tones. Uh, and so, you know, that's, um, that's probably the message that most people get. Like, it's, it's a sort of newer version of the I have nothing to hide, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really going to affect me that much. Therefore, I, um, I don't worry. I have to say, though, that I think a lot depends also on uh, the, the sort of, let's say, national culture. Now, national culture is a bit of a stereotype. But, uh, you know, I can uh, tell you that, um, for example, one time we were traveling with our van in Germany and we wanted to pay a campsite with the card uh, because we had run out of cash. And the guy was like, no, there's no option. And it's like, how come that we cannot pay with the card? And this guy went like, well, because we are all surveilled. And I wanted to kiss him, right? Because I was like, wow, this is like a conversation in the middle of, of the night. In, in, a, in a van uh, park, essentially, more than, more than, a, you know, uh, than, than a campsite. And I found someone who is uh, concerned about this. So I do believe that, uh, it seems to me at least, that, for example, the peculiar history of uh, Germany with the experience of the Stasi has probably remained somewhere ingrained in people's minds. And, uh, you know, you seem to have, by you I mean uh, German people, seem to have much more awareness of surveillance and its risks than, for example, it happens. Uh, it is the case in Italy. The case, what I mentioned about the football stadium of uh, the Roma mm -hmm. uh, FC, uh, I couldn't find a single uh, critical piece that would question this introduction, this technology, from the privacy point of view. It was literally, it, all the, 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 report, the report that I could find was, hey, that's great, we are advanced, we are ahead of others, it's so cool, technological innovation, we can go back to the stadium. Oh, wow. And the fans didn't resist at all, the hooligans, that would be hard to imagine in, in Germany, actually. So, um, this was presented not as, uh, you know, used by police forces, but it was presented as we use it to track was temperature so that we are going to kick that person out so that it doesn't infect you with COVID. Okay. And uh, that's what, how it was uh, presented. So, it was a private um, enterprise doing that and it was not linked, at least officially, mm -hmm. to uh, the issue of security. I think it's very interesting that you mention a cultural difference there. Um, I would uh, say yes on one hand, on the other I, I still would doubt it. I mean, of course there was the GDR, which was a small country, as we know, compared to Western Germany. And, uh, but there was also heavy resistance to the censuses in the 80s here, where they burned down uh, yeah. community houses and everything, it was quite hard. Yeah. But then on the other hand, we all know what traces we leave voluntarily uh, on the internet, and I don't think Germany uh, is any different than any other uh, nation that is online, so to speak. So I really don't know uh, how to make sense of that, which brings me, of course, to your five ways of resistance you uh, uh, outlined tonight. You know, it's basically about increasing agency, which, uh, which sounds good, but, uh, you know, again, what we've seen after the Snowden leaks, when was that, 2013, uh, where crypto parties actually started, at least in Berlin, where I come from, crypto parties started to hit uh, a little bit more prominently, uh, but in the end, I'm not sure, you know, how big or, or, or thorough that change actually was. I know hardly anybody that does, you know, even encrypts their email uh, or things like that. So it, it's not really a success, even after a massive leak uh, uh, like the Snowden leaks and almost 10 years ago, imagine that. And, and what you advocate for uh, is very interesting on very different levels, but I also think uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for everyone, you know, especially for those who have too much work on their hands already, uh, be it for money, being for care work, whatever, underpaid work and so forth. Uh, it's a lot to do for people. If you sort of delegate um, resistance on a, an individual level at the end, how do you, what do we make out of this? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, there's no other revelations, haven't changed, haven't produced enough change, not definitely for my own point of view. I remember, um, you know, presenting a, a funding uh, application 
that was based exactly on, it was right after 2014, and it was based on a hypothesis that this non-revelation would really change our perspective of surveillance. Mm. Because people like me who have been studying those things and you know, being exposed to a certain type of activism for a long time, we already knew it in a way, maybe we didn't mm. know the details, the extent of it, but you, know, you, could, you already, you've learned over the years to be suspicious of all of this. But essentially, um, you know, the fact that for, for the first time, a surveillance program is in the daily news, right? Mm -hmm. it, is, mm -hmm. it is of concern of, for example, the president, the then president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, that goes to the United Nations. So it, it, it really becomes a, a topic of public debate. It was unprecedented. Unfortunately, you're right, he hasn't produced enough change, or let's say long-lasting change. We might be aware, we probably all are by now, that we are surveilled to some extent, mm -hmm. but we decide we are okay with that because at the end of the day, it's convenient, right? Our digital life where, you know, yep. I go to Frankfurt and I, uh, my phone supposedly knows the food that I like and I get served personalized recommendations about my ideal restaurant is, is why not, right? But uh, indeed, there's also a number of uh, social groups uh, individuals, but also communities who are far less privileged and they definitely cannot say no to certain type of surveillance. Think, for example, about Uber uh, drivers. You probably don't have Uber in Germany, right? Oh, it's, we do. Uh, oh, some you do? Cities, okay. Some cities ban them, some yeah, don't. No, no. Depends. And, and those, uh, you know, uh, they, are, they are bound to the platform because that's where their uh, work comes from. So, again, the level of, so let's say, if uh, it should not uh, be delegated exclusively at, resistance should not be de uh, delegated exclusively at the individual level, that's why I ended with, you know, a sort of call for reform. No. But um, at the same time, it's also important to um, train the generations of the future in making informed choices from the start. So to us, given we were not raised with these tools, uh, it might uh, take probably uh, more energy and more time uh, to our age group, let's say, than it might take to kids born in uh, you know, 2015. But then we also have to empower them from the start. That's why uh, literacy. literacy. So is we so have to yeah. basically mm -hmm. ingrain and bad uh, you know, uh, this type of concerns in school education and also uh, um, basically give people the tools to make informed choices. Let's stick to those five ways just a little bit longer, um, if you allow, Stefania. We've had managing the setting, the settings, right, uh, of your apps, managing the settings uh, to like check what you allow your phone to do if it needs, if an app uh, asks for your camera, where it uh, when it doesn't need it really. Um, you talked about number two, I think, obfuscation, pretty much. Number three, literacy. Now you just mentioned again now crypto parties as an example. Um, three more counter uh, imaginaries. You mentioned apps like Dazzle that were covered in Vogue even. I where you might expect some sort of cultural phenomenon that it becomes cool uh, to dress like that or to do your haircut um, in a, a according style and, um, you know, pretty much basic um, political uh, resistance, uh, resistance with reclaim um, your face. Now, again, um, this sort of reminds me in some ways to the discussions. It's not identical, but I'm just trying to make this connection here to discussions we've had in the 90s, uh, you know, with people like the Chaos Computer Club, of course, where everybody thought, oh, we all have to learn to code. Uh, that's, our, that's our gateway to heaven, right? Uh, we can do this right if we all learn to code. Of course, nobody learned to code, pretty much, uh, uh, or not, not many people, and the apps and the interfaces just got more and more convenient, and that's where we we're at now, actually. It's this kind of... Um, call to sort of reverse uh, this whole development we've had to convenient interfaces. What we have to do, what you advocate for in many cases here, is actually look behind the interface. It's actually to see how it is wired. And I mean, you can, you just have to use a whole lot of time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this might reflect my obsession for infrastructure. I'm very interested in understanding how things work, mm -hmm. and I do believe that informed choices goes through that privileged uh, path, if you mm -hmm. want, in the sense that it's only by 
you know, knowing not exactly how things work. I mean, it's impossible to, to know, uh, even for the most expert uh, software developer, how, for example, any social media platform algorithms actually work, precisely because, for example, they are um, proprietary software. So we don't have, we can only reverse engineer them if you want. Mm. So uh, try to understand uh, the, the source code from their behavior, but they are way too complex to actually do any of this type of exercises. Um, but, um, you know, that said, I do believe that at least the mindset that encourages people to not take things, whatever you put instead of thing, you know, app or uh, device or, you know, technical solution, at face value, that is the attitude. So you might not actually learn to code, but you might learn to ask critical questions. So is, the, is really the, the sort of practicing suspicion, uh, in a way, and, and asking yourself what this is for, how does it work, that it might not take you to actually learn to code. It's, and even if you do, it's impossible to understand most of the machinery that surrounds sure. us anyway. But at least uh, you have uh, the ability to make some informed uh, choices. We are never going to be completely clean and pure unless we live, and probably not even if we live on top of a mountain, right? But um, if we want to be citizens that understand even, you know, uh, like how to process information, uh, today, which is very different from how you used to process information when you were at university, right? Then we have to understand how the machine uh, works. Yeah. When we talk about literacy, especially in a night like this, that is, uh, you know, again, a joint venture between uh, an academic organization like the Humboldt Institute and the uh, um, Federal Agency for Civic Education. When we talk about literacy, we talk about, you know, the main state apparatus, uh, which mm -hmm. is the schools, right? Um, and we see sort of very ambivalent um, signals from a lot of schools. You mentioned some of them in uh, other papers I've read by you, where it's um, sometimes even mandatory to use WhatsApp or Facebook or um, Google Drives or whatever to actually participate um, or to, uh, to do tests and so forth. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about the regulatory level there because I mean there are um, things proposed by certain commissions uh, on a European level that want to ensure what they call interoperability right mm -hmm. which basically it's, it's it sounds complicated it's very easy it's if you have um, a whatsapp messenger uh, uh, app you have to be able to send the message to say signal or any other messaging app if you um, think this towards the end it's much more far-reaching you'd have to exchange files between Spotify and Apple music and so forth to ensure interoperability what you use there what you buy in one place you have to be able to send to another place right now is this um, a promising regulatory way to actually circumvent to what's happening in many schools that sort of, uh, you know, force you to use certain platforms um, and certain apps. Do you think that is bound to succeed what is actually being tried in Brussels? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that interoperability is the answer because, mm -hmm. you know, way or another, you're always bound to a platform or another. Mm -hmm. So, mm, we might want to use certain platforms, certain mm -hmm. services, uh, mm -hmm. like chat messaging. I mean, they're, they're very convenient. Like, my family of origin is in a different country. I don't even have to do a, any more sure. uh, an international call, right? I can just call through Signal or Telegram or WhatsApp, whatever, right? But, so, it, again, we are back into the trap of convenience. But then there's also probably, if, thinking in particular about schools, we should really ask ourselves, do we really need all that technology and what mm. does technology do? What does it substitute, is it a substitute for and can we probably do without it? Um, I mean, yesterday, I, I mentioned I was at this uh, briefly, uh, at this Edu Tech, um, how is it called? Uh, not in festival, Edu Tech, um, Europe. Uh, so it was basically companies paying awful lot of money to have a stand there 
Uh, so it, it's, it's a festival that is open to essentially ministries, but also uh, public procurement agencies that then buy, you know, all the expensive equipment and software for, you know, a whole lot of schools in the country, uh, individual, for example, universities of education institutions and so on and so forth. And uh, I've heard Google talking about we need more standardization. Mm. Uh, which mm. is a different story, right? Standardization mm -hmm. is actually, uh, you know, basically making sure that certain... So it's not interoperability, it's, it's machines talking to each other in a way, like, mm -hmm. but exchanging content, but standardization is really machines working with each other, yeah. understanding each other, so at a more basic level. And um, when I heard the Google talking about standardization, it was more... I, in my mind, it read essentially like... Um, well, this actually means you should use our product more than, you know. So we provide an excellent platform, which is actually true. I mean, it's a very well-functioning platform with a lot of, I mean, talking about Google Classroom, with a lot of functionalities. And you should actually, you know, come to us and kind of embed your product uh, in there. So um, to me, ultimately, um, the, the solution is really, again, taking a step back and asking ourselves exactly, for example, do we really need this emotion detection in real time so that me as a teacher can see whether my school uh, pupils are, are following or they're sad or, you know, their dog died that morning? Maybe the information is important, maybe it's not strictly necessary to go through the, the, the technology. Maybe I can simply talk to people, right? So. Um, I think this, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I'm not 100% sure that interoperability is the solution. No. It probably allows to break some, monop not really break, but like hinder a little bit, shake a little bit some monopolies, and that definitely allows for more choice. So to speak to my family members who only have WhatsApp, I don't have to install WhatsApp, I can still stay in my preferred app of choice. That helps, but it's only a cosmetic type of approach, I think. Mm -hmm. One last question before we open this up here to the public and um, to the people at home watching is, um, you know, one of the core sentences of your talk, of course, I think, was that a vacation is endangering liberal democracy, something we have discussed often here in the last mm -hmm. five years. It is um, certainly a, a big issue, but um, I always like to ask, can it also, when coded differently, uh, lead to actual empowerment of the marginalized, as in controlling the state, you know, as, you know, basically asking the questions in whose hands the tools are. I mean, some examples, uh, for example, in China, we see that datification and monitoring of um, big companies also leads to uh, less pollution. <laughs> things like that. So we have really positive effects of this, of course, ma massive and very authoritative, um, authoritarian uh, datification that we see in China, but there's also very positive effects in that. That's not really what I mean as a way for Europe, but just, you know, asking the plain question, can we actually put those tools in the hands of the marginalized to sort of counter uh, this datification with a datification with a diverse datification. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I decided to, uh, to focus my talk today on resisting the challenges of the datafied society. But indeed, the datafied society offer also a lot of unprecedented opportunities. And, uh, you know, one example that I have in mind now um, is, for example, uh, Info Amazonia, um, a coalition, a network, in fact, of activists, environmental activists, anti-deforestation activists and journalists and storytellers and teachers that uh, various countries around the Amazon, I mean, in that, you know, you know the, the Amazon forest uh, being the biggest in the world crosses several countries and we use uh, data fact, tools of notification, if you want. I mean, like, for example, drones and apps of various kinds to monitor deforestation and then provide uh, information trying to lobby uh, against uh, uh, this, uh, this type of phenomenon, which is massive, especially in Brazil. And, uh, you know, but one thing is to say, hey, there's a lot of trees coming down. And the other thing is, another completely different thing is actually providing evidence of something which is in fact very far away from having, uh, any uh, 
uh, living uh, in you know, any city or, or and the public purview where a lot of people live, right? So that's that's one example. Another one that also comes from, from, from Latin America for some reason is in Argentina. In Argentina, people knew for a long time that there was a problem with gender violence or domestic violence, mm -hmm. violence against women. But again, there were no numbers. There was no... Um, attempt by uh, police forces or by the state to keep track of this phenomenon. So how do you advocate against this? How do you mm. try to create a different culture of respect at home if you actually don't know the contours of the problem? And there, what, uh, what people do, did there, a feminist group mm, came together to, uh, you know, <laughs> count literally um, uh, the death of uh, women in uh, the country. And then starting, uh, you know, using funky software that is real, ready available everywhere for mm. free now to produce data visualization. And then this data visualization made the problem apparent and then the problem became actually a public domain, became an issue that people all of a sudden were concerned about. So it was not only my experience of my friend being killed, but all of a sudden it's something that concerns us as a society. Um, but there's plenty, you know, for example, collecting evidence of the Syrian um, conflict. This is actually a project in, uh, based in uh, Berlin called the Syrian Archive that collects yeah. evidence yeah. of uh, any violence committed by all sides of the Syrian conflict. And this evidence maybe one day will be used in court uh, in The Hague, for example, in the international uh, court. Um, as it happened, for example, with uh, the Yugoslavia um, tribunal, right? So uh, there's a lot of work to do in the sense that we have to rethink also all the tenets of, um, you know, for example, the legal system. What evidence produced by me on my phone then can be used in court under what conditions, for example. So mm -hmm. there's, it, there's a lot of work to do at various levels, but definitely uh, we have a lot of tools that allow us today to use, um, you know, the possibilities to turn in our favor, essentially. Um, all of these um, developments. Thank you for those examples once again, uh, Stefania. So uh, let me ask you here on the floor. There's a microphone going around. Stefania, uh, has it, where are you? And uh, Stefania, Stefanie, Entschuldigung. <laughs> there she is in the back of the room. Any questions from the audience here from the floor before we go to the digital tool? Feel free. Questions or just comments on what you've heard. Well, there's one. <laughs> Otherwise, we just switch to, to Slido and see what's happening there. But please, Sasha. Uh, yes, thank you for your talk. Um, not that much of a detailed question, rather uh, if you'd like to share maybe um, some of your principles or strategies and how to cope with the surveillance and the problems coming from that, or what, what do you do? As an anecdote on that, I'm kind of trying to circumvent sur surveillance. Uh, one of the few steps I took was changing my, my search engines. Um, well, <laughs> but that often leads to uh, little funny moments with my wife where she really asks me to please stop using this this, this engine, because the, the results are not as good as she's used to be when she's working on my, my device or using my, my smartphone. Have you some principles on how to change your private environment uh, there? There's many different um, examples, like with kindergarten or in school or with colleagues. How do you communicate with them? Do you have any, any tips there? That's a good question, and uh, it's also, uh, well, you know, I don't have the magic band, I don't have a perfect answer, and mine as well is in part a history of failure, <laughs> in the sense that we all start with the best intention, with a very secure stack of, uh, you know, trying to, to make uh, our uh, life um, airtight in a way, but then it doesn't <laughs> work as planned. Why? Because, you know, you might encrypt your mails, but then uh, your interlocutor doesn't, or you might encrypt your mails and lose the password. It happened to me twice, so then you have to start again. Um, you know, it was such a secure password that I couldn't find it anymore. Um, so even people who, like me, have actually a considerable amount of time, or let's say, I studied this stuff, so 
I can make room for experimenting as well. So in that sense, I'm privileged. It doesn't always necessarily work. Um, I have to say, when it comes to the daycare, which our daughter just started uh, this week, we did pick a daycare which, which does not communicate to parents via WhatsApp. But what they do, they don't send you pictures, so once the kid isn't there, you don't know what is happening, but they actually write a paper diary. They still exist. <laughs> so um, that's, I think, um, a positive um, you know, observation that also has reached this type of environment. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a colleague who was um, uh, the, the, the classroom of um, her child um, was, used what, was using WhatsApp to notify of positive uh, COVID positive cases and then telling everyone then to, oh, wow. you know, uh, stay at home and whatever. And she only got the message because she didn't use WhatsApp two weeks afterwards <laughs> when it was not exactly very relevant anymore, but it could potentially have exposed, uh, you know, her family and others to, uh, you know, the virus. So, um, but talking about positive experiences, probably I can mention uh, the one um, of our uh, research group in Amsterdam we spent just to give you a sense of the effort that sometimes goes into this, something like two years to create a completely secure stack to do our research and collaborate uh, with each other, also remotely, via encrypted uh, channels, using only certain platforms, and especially, uh, for example, uh, how, what do you do when you um, author a text together and you don't want to use the mainstream um, docs that are uh, then searchable by search engines, then you have to use alternatives. And there are alternatives for that as well, but then sometimes, at least in the case of our research group, it requires a little bit of financial effort to pay for a password protective service and to you know, run our own servers ourselves. But it is increasingly difficult also at the, at the university level because um, they actually want us to use for example, exclusively Microsoft services now, mm. including for storage. So, um, mm. you know, this is to say that, uh, you know, I could mention software, but um, software comes and goes. Sometimes, especially open source software, sometimes not so well maintained. It's definitely not as funky as, uh, you know, other more beautiful looking uh, commercial software. And uh, it requires a lot of patience. Hmm. And often we have to be prepared to uh, failures. Again, there's the time factor, right? You have to privilege enough to have time in your hands to actually uh, stay on top and to maintain those things. Thank you uh, for that question. Is there another one from the floor? Thank you here. Third row, please. Okay, thank you. So, um, first of all, also from my side, uh, thank you for the talk so far. And you mentioned that um, we in Germany have maybe a bit uh, further advanced awareness to towards uh, surveillance because of our um, history with the uh, Stasi and so on. Um, and how would you maybe um, compare the different countries internationally, the different areas of the world uh, concerning their surveil surveillance awareness, maybe? Well, this is a million dollar question in the sense that uh, also my observation about Germany was not based on any empirical data, was based on my conversations. And by, you know, for example, uh, noticing how, um, when was that, the, with the data retention legislation, so it was around, I think, 2007, so a piece of EU legislation which for the most part went completely unnoticed because it was... Uh, very dry and you know very boring type of, 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 of topic. Um, in Germany, there were a couple of demonstrations gathering, I think one even 30,000 people, which is something unheard of in any other country, right? So um, my then observation uh, about you know the higher level of awareness about these topics um, in Germany is only based on this, right? So I don't have any uh, empirical data and uh, I also don't have empirical data about other countries. And as a researcher, I should probably only talk on the basis of empirical data, but in this case, I'm not. Now, um, we can uh, have a notice, for example, there's the Eurobarometer, which is the basically continuous pulling instrument of the European uh, Union that monitors a number of aspects of, uh, you know, people's beliefs and preferences and stuff like that. And uh, they also monitor, for example, uh, the digital uh, skills and digital awareness. 
Um, and um, you can see, uh, you know, essentially they ask people, not even, you know, do you have a critical attitude towards something, but how later do you consider yourself being versus, you know, various, uh, various type of uh, tools. And uh, you can see there's some countries, especially in Northern Europe, are leading, I don't remember now the exact uh, list, and some countries, especially in the South, Southern Eastern Europe, are uh, lagging behind. And uh, there might be a variety of reasons. I refer to the study because, again, uh, thinking about the data retention uh, demonstrations, uh, I still have the T-shirt that was produced, but I don't even remember what Berlin group back then that um, used some of the design of those times to uh, bring it under the spotlight the then minister of let's say information, whatever, that was a person in charge of implementing this legislation in Germany. And, uh, and to, for me, it was uh, extremely impressive to see how, you know, um, basically they had made sense of history to present a topic that, uh, or at least history in the sense of something that people might not have necessarily lived through but are, are familiar with, at least for having heard about it, to make sense of something very complex in today's society. And, um, but uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to do also here, I'm uh, fairly sure. Thank you. Let's look uh, at Slido. Is there anything going on at Slido? Who's doing Slido? There you are. Please. I think we need some light. Don't we have some light on you here? <laughs> no. No light anymore. <laughs> Uh, good night. I want to thank you for your time and for sharing. Um, I think you started by saying that data oh. is not as like increasingly less accessible, uh, and I would like you to ask to expand on that, especially how by being a commodity it can promote inequality by being not accessible to the majority of people. Um, was was I clear? Is the question? No, I actually miss the first word. Okay. What is not accessible? That uh, technology that uh, if it's becoming like less accessible, I want to ask you to expand on that. Yeah, that's a, that's an important question because it goes back. It allows me to reflect on something that is no longer as popular as it was um, at the turn of. Uh, the millennium, let's say. So in the, about uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, 20, 25 years ago, which is the issue of the digital divide. Is it the direction where you want me to go or so, good. Uh, I start from there to then, you know, go to the present day. So, uh, the digital divide refers to a problem that's extremely important, which is, you know, the fact that some people have access to technology, some others are not. Now, what we see is today we no longer care about digital divide, at least it's no longer part of, uh, you know, uh, there's not many policies about this anymore. Uh, but also towards uh, um, developing countries. And a lot of this is left to the private sector to solve. So there's still a problem of access, there's still a problem of privilege, there's still a problem of you know, lack of um, devices and machines, but what we see is that the industry is trying to solve it. And, uh, for example, you might remember a discussion recently about the zero rating uh, problem, not really recently, about 10 years ago, I guess, by now. Uh, the zero rating services refer to services that essentially were offered, like st a strip naked, in a way, to people who couldn't pay. So, for example, in India, if you couldn't um, access data on your phone, then, um, so if you, were, you know, didn't have a subscription to, uh, to have data traffic, by installing, for example, Facebook, you would have right to some data through Facebook, which then meant that, for example, uh, for certain African countries, there were actually interesting studies about this, pretty depressive, but it almost makes us smile, but it's unfortunately a sad reality. For a lot of people, the news then were Facebook, for example, right? Because it was the selection that would reach them through the device and the only type of interaction that they had to the device, which was the zero rating, meaning free service, data service offered by uh, Facebook. So um, this is one dimension of uh, the problem. And then the other dimension of the problem is uh, the issue of visibility and invisibility. Now, we tend to think that privacy um, is very important and we uh, you know, uh, keep it in high regard, and rightly so, but not everyone as the possibility of saying no to certain services. Uh, remember what, that I mentioned, for example, the case of India. 
where there is this digital identity system, you might also want to stay out of that. But what if then you have, uh, you're poor uh, and you need to put food on the table, you need those food subsidies. Then it becomes, uh, I mean, the only way is to give out your fingerprint, for example. So, um, and in that case, uh, you know, privacy becomes a secondary uh, concern, but also being visible to the state becomes extremely important. And this also concerns a number of communities also in our rich society, for example, migrant communities, uh, or the so-called undocumented migrants that, uh, you know, there are many of in our um, in our societies as well, who, uh, because they were afraid of uh, being reported and maybe they didn't go during the, the pandemic to get, um, you know, uh, a COVID test, but at the same time, uh, you know, being visible to the state also meant that they couldn't get access to any, for example, subsidy or income supplement that the state might have made available. So, in a way, the problem of what was called a digital divide has spiraled up in many new dimensions. And definitely, in a nutshell, technology has not solved the problem of inequality. That would be solutionism, right? We brauchen das Mikrofon hier vorne. Ich wechsle kurz nach Deutsch, um uh, zu gucken, was uh, im Digitalen sich zugetragen hat. Let's the Batory tool of tonight and see. If um, questions came up there, please, Sasha Shaya. Yeah, the, some questions came up there. One you tackled somehow with your last answer already, uh, and it was a topic that came through again and again. Um, through your talk, um, how do your surveillance practices affect social injustice and social divide? Privileged, wealthier people tend to be more able to address the problem and resist on a small scale, uh, e.g. using devices on, like Apple and such. Um, as one question, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit further. Another question I just like to add and then you can decide. Um, surveillance has become commonplace, especially among the young generation who has grown up with it. How can we help them see the need for protection? I think the first one we just covered pretty much, the yeah. um, social divide, so to speak, the inequality uh, reproduced uh, by surveillance technologies, of course, but the, the latter one would aim at what we've talked about in terms of literacy, I guess, right? How to teach? Yeah, well, uh, yeah I want to start with... Um, uh, referring to the work uh, by Lina Danzig and colleagues at Cardiff University Data Justice Lab, Lina in particular wrote about what she calls surveillance realism. Hmm. So essentially we live so much submerged, immersed in a surveillance society that we have lost the ability to notice and uh, to, to care essentially, but even to imagine any, any alternative, right? So at some point, surveillance or whatever, monitoring or being spied, cameras, becomes a given, and you sort of surrender. You're like, okay. Um, once again, literacy is indeed uh, key. Mm -hmm. And um, there, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but I always find interesting to let uh, people experience first and uh, the drawbacks or the problem. I'll give you an example. Um, and I have to refer to the work of a great developer, Claudio Agosti, also a collaborator of us uh, in Amsterdam, who um, wanted to make people reflect on their information diet. So uh, it was like, you know, we're not going to get people out of Facebook or, or YouTube or any other platform. Let's show them firsthand what they're missing out, or what this software does to them, what this platform does to them. And... Um, so what he did was to create a software that gathers uh, data uh, about your private content, but also then serves to you the content, but of course uh, that, that you, you have been given, but compared to the content that other population or reference have been uh, given. So to see what you are missing out. So in a way what I find interesting is to give people much more than the theoretical uh, considerations which are, you know, theoretical, but to make people experience firsthand what it means to them. Another great example is Amazon and the dynamic pr uh, pricing that is implemented by Amazon. So you know by now probably that um, you get a different price on Amazon if depending on uh, your IP, so your location where you're browsing from, your, com your browser, 
your computer. Mm. So for example, if you are an Apple user, you're likely to get a slightly higher price because you are automatically placed in a, a, a more wealthy uh, sector of uh, the user population and so on and so forth. And um, when it comes to money, people tend to be a bit more sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. So political content, yeah, whatever, I have my own opinion, I'm not, I'm not gonna be, you know, gonna change that. No one really likes the idea of being steered around, like taken by the nose by the platform, right? But uh, when you actually show how this affects um, the, you know, buying habits, then it becomes already uh, more concrete and more um, interesting, especially for those who actually earn money. So maybe it might not work very well with school children, but it might work uh, better uh, with um, older, um, the older population. But, um, you know, um, Claudio Agosti did that ex experiment. It's actually on a video produced for uh, an Itali the Italian broadcaster Rai. And uh, so there was software developer developed on purpose to sort of to say, although it's a bit incorrect, but reverse engineer uh, the, uh, the algorithms that implement the uh, dynamic pricing on Amazon and then evidence being uh, produced and it's on camera. And this, I'm sure, made a lot of people uh, think about what algorithms do to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stefani. We usually close with... Um with the R question, the regulation question, but since we've covered um, some of that already, I'd like to um, ask a different question and play a little bit the devil's advocate maybe right at the end. In Germany, uh, we have quite a different app than in Italy, it's called, you see it blinking red now, everybody who has it on, it's probably red. So it's called Corona Born App, right? Um, and the interesting fact about the development of this app um, at the time when it was developed, I think in summer of 2020, although time frames sort of are blurry by now with two and a half years of the pandemic, right? I think it happens to everybody, it's not just my age, right? Um, the interesting thing was that the data security proposed by the tech giants, in this case Apple, actually was much higher than what the initially state-favored models were. And some people said, quite many said, that the lack of su success of this also tracing app, it doesn't, it doesn't just do tracing, it does many other things, or it has learned to do uh, many other things too, that the lack of success was actually due to its high security standards, which were extremely high. I mean, many data activists said, yeah, well, yeah, let's favor the tech giants model because it's a lot better of what the state initially proposed. And of course, we know all about those PR campaigns with the new iPhone and Google and so forth. They're all about privacy, right? They really stress that. And I wanted to ask you as a closing question, do they learn? Is there a change imminent actually by those tech giants? The Corona One app would be one example. I'm not sure if it's a contingent example or not. What would you say? Well, the other example is WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp was not encrypted. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. although the, there's various analysis of yeah. uh, how tight the encryption is, but let's, uh, let's leave it at that. But, uh, you know, Signal was encrypted, mm -hmm. and then WhatsApp used actually similar technology to also go encrypted. In a way, um, you know, the industry goes, I mean, it's often leads the way, but often responds also to the needs of the market and the desires of consumers. So if you want to sell a product, you have to satisfy people's uh, desires. So if the society changes, but for that you need literacy probably, mm. and, and awareness raising and campaigning and, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, awareness creation, um, then the tech giants might adjust or might also lead the way because it's probably the best technical solution. I am probably a bit suspicious of the, the good deeds or the good uh, agenda, let's say, the, the, the global common good agenda, although there's actually several examples of that as well coming from the industry. But, uh, you know, it's not for me to say, but um, there, is, there is hope also in the industry for sure, if that's uh, the question. But definitely we have to become more aware uh, and more concerned, uh, users and consumers, to contribute to drive this change. Thank you so much for that closing statement. Thank you for being with us. This was the last edition of 2022 of Making Sense of the Digital Society, now exclusively in Frankfurt on Main. Thank you for being with us here online. Thank you for making all those travels for us. 
Stefania Milan. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.